Hello, everyone, and welcome to Vagina Problems with Laura Parker. I am Allison Carvalho, the events manager for Barbara's Bookstores. Barbara's is a Chicago institution since 1963, and we are incredibly excited to be bringing you this virtual event. We're a family-owned and operated bookstore, and we pride ourselves on creating community spaces within our stores, as well as out of them, like these events. We are so honored to be hosting this event with two amazing organizations, the Chicago Foundation for Women and the Chicago Women's Health Center. The Chicago Foundation for Women invests in women and girls as catalysts, building strong communities for all. And the Chicago Women's Health Center facilitates the empowerment of women, trans people, and young people by providing access to health care and health education. Over 6,000 women, trans people, and young people have access to health services through the CWHC each year. Before we go into our discussion, I want to give you guys a quick tour of Crowdcast for those of you who haven't used it before. First of all, we are still relatively new to virtual events. We've been doing them since June, but you know it's the internet you never know what's going to happen so please bear with us in case we're having any technical difficulties we're going to get things back up and running as quickly as we possibly can feel free to chat with other book lovers in the chat on the side uh, we will be providing links with more information about upcoming events and book recommendations in there as well if you notice your video is freezing or lagging just go to the little gear icon on the bottom of your screen and change your hd setting to 360. we have noticed that, that tends to help with any lag people are experiencing the last 10 to 15 minutes of the event will be open for questions so please make sure to put your questions in the ask a question function that should be right below your screen you can also upvote other people's questions so you can look at it and if you like someone's question click on it and you can upvote it and it will move up in the queue for our moderator to ask also most importantly if you look at the bottom of your screen you're going to see a green button that says purchase vagina problems here that is where you can purchase this incredible book so make sure to click on that link and you can use our code event at checkout to get 10 percent off of your purchase today Alrighty. Oh, last thing, please make sure that we are being as respectful as we possibly can in the chat and throughout the event. We want these events to be informative and fun and give you a chance to talk about books with other book lovers. So please make sure to keep the space as respectful and kind as you can. Now that is everything. All right, we're going to go ahead and bring our moderator to the screen. Um, Scott Bratt is the Outreach and Education Director at Chicago Women's Health Center and provides body positive, queer inclusive, gender expansive, comprehensive sexual health education in Chicago's public schools, community based organizations, and area universities. As part of a feminist health center, CWHC sexual health programming is rooted in frameworks of reproductive justice and harm reduction and works with fourth through 12th graders, college age students, and adult allies. They hold a master's of, edu of education in youth development from the University of Illinois at Chicago. I am excited to bring to the screen, Scott Bratt. Hell, Scout Bratt, so sorry. How you doing, Scout? <laughs> Thank you, I'm so thrilled to be here. Really, really thankful to Barbara's Bookstore and to Laura for the incredible work that y'all are Thank doing. Thank you, yeah. We are so pumped to have you here. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and take myself off screen and you can go ahead and welcome our really, really amazing author today. Yes, thank you all for being here. I'm thrilled to welcome Lara Parker to a discussion about her recent publication, Vagina Problems. Lara Parker is a writer and the deputy editorial director at BuzzFeed and lives in Los Angeles but she grew up in a small town of just 900 people in Indiana. She's also been interviewed or appeared in Cosmopolitan, Cosmopolitan Australia, and Glamour. She began writing publicly on her blog, Outside the Comfort Zone, in college around the time of her diagnosis with endometriosis, and she hasn't stopped writing about her vagina since. So Laura, please join me. I can't wait to talk about your recent work. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here and to have this conversation. Right on, welcome. So, wow. I mean, I have read your book and loved so much of what you wrote that it's hard to find a place to start. But <laughs> we'll start with asking, you know, throughout the book, you really 
share a number of stories, different experiences, talk about a lot of different relationships and memories. And you've also published, like I just mentioned, you've been published on a variety of different platforms and in a variety of different spaces. So what inspired you to write a book? And yeah, tell us more about that. Yeah, I I honestly decided to try and pursue writing a book because it was something that I didn't feel like I had had when I first started going through my own vagina problems. Um, you know, there were books available and I don't want to take away from that, but a lot of them were very educational or very like, this is what you need to do to cure yourself. And that really wasn't what I was looking for. I really just wanted a space, um, a book to tell me that I wasn't alone, that I was going to be okay, um, that what I was feeling was valid. And I just didn't have that. And, you know, it became more and more clear that I had this platform and I was in the media space. So like, maybe I could do it. Um, and that's what really inspired me to try and create this thing that, you know, for 15 year old Lara, who, really needed this book, I think, in a lot of ways. Oh my God. <laughs> right on. Right on time. Your computer agrees with you. Yes. Yeah, good point. Oh, sorry. I didn't know I had messages on. <laughs> wow, right on. That notion that you didn't have this resource and so creating it for people to use. You also mentioned it being, you know, when you published one of your earlier BuzzFeed articles, like in April of 2014, that it was like you taking back ownership over the experiences you may have had and potential readers or attendees tonight, you can definitely read all about that in the, in the book, Vagina Problems. But I'd love to hear also if you have a goal for this book, knowing that it's filling a need, do you have a goal for how people use it? I think like outside of just hopefully people feeling less alone, my goal with this book is to really educate the masses on how traumatizing, how painful, and how horrific living with these conditions really is, and how it really is a public health crisis. Like, um, it's nothing short of a public health crisis. It deserves attention. It deserves care. And, you know, if nothing else, like I just want people to have a little bit more compassion when they hear someone in their life say that they're struggling with painful sex or struggling with endometriosis or something of that sort um, and sort of have that recognition of what that means and what all that could entail for someone's life. Yeah. Wow. I mean, when I read the the way you categorized endometriosis as a public health crisis and in the book you speak pretty explicitly and sharply about the cost, not just to individual people, but relationships, workplaces, financial costs, the number of work hours that folks miss who have endometriosis or experiences that fall under that umbrella category that you've created of vagina problems. Yeah, I mean, that notion of public health crisis is shocking and I think I'd love to hear a little bit more about why. Why do you want people to know that it's a public health crisis? Yeah, I mean, like you just said, it really impacts every single part of my life. There is not one moment of my day that is not impacted in some way by my vagina problems. And I think, you know, without that understanding and without people realizing what a crisis this is, we're never going to get the help that we need. Like we need people on our side because at this point it takes an average of seven to 10 years to get a diagnosis for endometriosis. You know, one in 10 people born with a vagina have painful sex. It's just like, these aren't uncommon experiences, but um, we still don't have answers or solutions for them still taking this long it still costs this much there's it, it's still so inaccessible to get care for these things so i think until um the general public and specifically like researchers doctors politicians really understand what we're up against which is a public health crisis then we're just absolutely never going to make the headway that we need in order to improve millions of people's lives that live with this pain every day yeah. Wow. Thank you. And thank you. I guess I should also just start with thank you for sharing so openly and directly about experiences that you've been having for many years and continue to have that I, I think you highlight yourself about that are re re 
received or treated with such shame and stigma and also non-awareness, right? So those three pieces of shame and stigma and just in general, lack of awareness really keep silence, like cover this entire experience that folks have on an everyday basis with silence. Absolutely. And I mean, I, I guess that's another question for, for you thinking about this being almost like a galvanizing call to action. It, your work is very honest and direct. And I'm, I know as someone who myself, I have a diagnosis of something under the umbrella of vagina problems. It resonated with me, but I would love to know who else you think this book is for beyond just maybe 15 year old you, who should be reading this and why should they be reading it? I mean, to be frank, I think that everyone has something to gain from this book. Um, I'm a little biased because I wrote it, but I really do believe that even if you don't experience this yourself, which let me just highlight again that like almost 200 million people worldwide live with endometriosis. Um, so the chances of you knowing someone who has endometriosis is pretty high. But outside of that, like sort of this umbrella, I call it vagina problems, but it's also like it's a chronic illness that's painful, that comes with a lot of stigma, comes with a lot of shame. The, the idea of a chronic illness and being surrounded by shame, shame and living with pain every day, that's not uncommon. Like millions and millions of people deal with this. So, you know, I really think that everyone has something to gain, um, whether it's just learning a little bit more about what people in their lives may deal with or whether it's learning a little bit more about how people with a chronic illness are treated by medical professionals or people in their life in general. Yeah, wow, right. That notion that it, chronic pain is another way we could speak about so much of what you mentioned in your book. I don't remember learning about chronic pain as a young person. And I am a sexual health educator and I work with young people. And I don't think I know, I don't know that I learned about chronic pain until I was an adult working at a healthcare institution, working at a clinic. And I guess that my question is also for you about educators, like sexual health educators, you talk a bit about, you know, there are so many layers to this lack of awareness and healthcare providers play a role. So do employers, sex educators, other care providers who may not specialize in gynecological care, but also sexual partners and family members and friends, specifically in terms of like knowing earlier on in your life, in one's life, what role do you think sexual health education could play in bringing chronic, chronic pain into conversation, acknowledging this as a public health crisis? Totally. I mean, as I speak about in my book, I grew up in a very small town in Indiana and my sex education was not an education. It was very much just like, here's sex, here's how men get off, um, no mention of painful sex, no real talk about like the female orgasm. I just felt like it was really, really lacking. And so that really set me up for failure uh, when I started experiencing pain associated with orgasm, pain associated with sex, because I didn't know how to talk about it. And I felt like I was doing something wrong. And in fact, like when I would bring it up, I was repeatedly told that I was doing something wrong. Like, oh, you shouldn't be having sex outside of marriage. You're too young you just take it like just drink wine whatever so i really think that like sex educators in particular um could really do a lot of change in this area by just giving people the tools or the words to describe what's happening and give them a safe space to describe painful sex and know that like no it's actually not okay i mean i was literally taught that when you lose your virginity it's just painful. Like I went into sex expecting it to be painful. And so when it was excruciating, I thought, okay, I guess this is just like what it's supposed to be. And that could have easily been mitigated if that wasn't sort of taught to me such, so often from such an early age. Um, so yeah, I think sex educators, like, I mean, y'all are doing like the Lord's work, but if you're doing it correctly, like you could really change people's lives, you know? Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Right. I that's such a such an important nuance that we are taught that sex should be painful. And it is possible that inserting something into the vaginal opening for the first time can feel pre like pressure that someone has not experienced before. 
However, if we aren't in our educational spaces specific about the variations or spectrums of pain and pleasure, then we actually are very much encouraging folks to swallow pain or to just deal with pain that in fact, I'm, I just fully agree, like excruciating pain is not okay. And very much so, the goal I think of sex ed is to teach people skills for how to advocate for themselves. However, if we don't introduce nuance or encourage people to check in with their body and share about what's happening in their body, then we can never help people gauge what is healthy or not as healthy for them. Totally. Yeah. I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about a concept that comes up regularly in your book about being normal, right? Yeah, I'd love to just hear your thoughts on that and what that word means to you and how it's changed in the way that you relate to it now. Totally. You know how you just mentioned like not learning about chronic pain uh, growing up and like I feel like I was very similar with that. Like when I first was diagnosed with endometriosis and introduced into the world of having an incurable disease, I had no idea with what that meant for me. Um, and I really had to like readjust my entire life's expectations and everything that felt normal or safe to me, I guess. Um, and, you know, the idea of normal, especially around sex, was always difficult for me. I'm a straight woman, so not being able to specifically have penetrative sex without excruciating pain did not feel normal. And it made me feel like such an outsider to the point where, like, I would be sitting at like a dinner table with friends pre-COVID, RIP, such good memories. And we'd be discussing just like casual friend conversation and the conversation would somehow lead to sex that they were having. And I would just like burst out into tears and like have to leave the table because I felt like such an outsider. Like I wasn't allowed to have a seat at the table because I wasn't normal in the way that I could have sex or couldn't in this case. Um, it's the same thing with chronic pain. It's like when you aren't able to do the things that you've been taught or the way that you're allowed to live your life according to like whatever society, you just feel like an outsider. And I think and that's another reason I wanted to write this book is to let you know people living with this know that you're not alone. And even though it feels like we're the outsiders or we're not normal, it's just a different way of doing things. And that doesn't mean that it's not, you know, I call it the new normal in my book, but it's like, just a, it's just different. And that doesn't mean that it's bad. It's just, I really had to learn that, especially with painful sex, because I just felt like such an outsider. Like I wasn't even allowed to participate or have an orgasm because I couldn't have penetrative sex. So I couldn't have a seat at the table. Right, that, and I, I so appreciate what you mentioned in the book, which is, once you're excluded from that table, it seems that sex is everywhere, that like it's on every billboard, it's part of every conversation, every television show. And, you know, I think about it as a queer person feeling that way about hetero and cis folks being like, whoa, it's everywhere. My like non-normalness or abnormalities are like so, it seems so loud. And I think what you're mentioning also is when we have a really specific definition of sex, which Sex equals penetration, according to your book, and so much of the world. And that, as you said in your book, that as long as a man is satisfied, like the man will experience pleasure, release sperm cells, and then a pregnancy is created, that's sex. It really limits how we can relate to sex, be sexual people, or engage in sex. And again, then how we define ourselves. And I just, I think that's a really huge point that you're making that is applicable to folks no matter their experience with vagina problems, that it's so widely widely applicable. Um, and honestly, it does also remind me a lot of the foundation of Chicago Women's Health Center is out of the Jane Abortion Network and the feminist health movement, which essentially was challenging the notions of really restrictive concepts of of health and what is healthy and how people should be living in their bodies. It'd be great specifically thinking about the Boston Women's Health Book Collective and the book, Our Bodies Ourselves. I'd love to hear if there are movements or people or organizations you've looked to for support 
because so much of what you were doing is advocating for yourself, being your own research assistant, your own doctor, having to rewrite what we know about mm -hmm. vagina problems and endometriosis. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny that you mentioned the abortion foundation because when I saw this question earlier and was like thinking through like what has inspired me, like it really has been just the reproductive rights movement, the fertility movement, like seeing what, you know, women or people with uteruses and vaginas have been up against for so long and just seeing like how they've had to persist and really advocate for themselves and say, no, this is what I want to do with my body. And this is what's right. Like, I really have looked to that to draw strength because I didn't know how to talk about this when it first happened. I didn't have anyone in my life that was going through it knowingly. Anyway, I had no clue. And I didn't even know that doctors could be wrong when I first started this. Like I fully went into it thinking that they were always right. So when they kept telling me that nothing was wrong with me, I just kept thinking like, okay, they must be right. And now I feel like my entire world has been shifted, but for the better. Um, and you know, a lot of other health advocates in the chronic illness space, whether it's fibromyalgia, lupus, whatever, like they've, you know, they've been in this for so long, some of them and have been sort of fighting against the whole doctor situation for so long. Um, it's been really helpful for me to have that type of foundation before I came along. Yeah, oh, thank you for sharing that. I, right, that notion of like, doctors aren't always right. And I think the same thing is true, like teachers aren't always right. That there is no one source of power or authority that knows us necessarily better than we do and our individual lived and embodied experiences. And while we're coupling together knowledge from different resources or movements and support people that also there's some unlearning about putting all of our faith into one authority figure or one source of knowledge. That's to me feels like deeply feminist and also like an uphill battle almost. It's like against the stream. And so requires that sort of like re-energizing and recommitting, right? Um, I mean, anyone with a chronic illness knows or anyone who's ever tried to stand up to a doctor knows how exhausting it is and also how just fucking scary it is. Like they are the power figure in that relationship. There's um, a major like disproportion of who has the power and it's yeah, it's, it is a lot of unlearning and it's a lot of, it's, it's tiring. And, you know, most people who have a chronic illness have jobs outside of it. Um, but we're doing double because, you know, what choice do you have? But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. 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 And that notion that it's also often hidden or silenced is that other, this other layer of what your book is uncovering is that the more that we don't talk about it, the harder it is to fight back potentially or for others to be supportive. I I do think it would be great to hear you speak a little bit. You know, what stood out to me also in your book was that your mom was outside of an appointment when you were at the Mayo Clinic. And there was a moment in which you were you had said like you wished your mom had come in, but you were embarrassed to have her come in and visit with you. It'd be great to hear what you would recommend or what you would want adult allies to do for young people who are, you know, somewhere along their seven years in a medical journey of potentially being diagnosed or seeing a series of doctors? Yeah, I think honestly, that it's really, really important to sort of um, remember, like what we were just talking about, that doctors aren't always right, and they don't always have the answers. Um, and if they're telling you that something's wrong, like maybe, you know, like definitely value what your child or the person in your life that you're sort of accompanying, definitely value what they're saying. And that's not to say that my parents didn't. I just think that, you know, we all went into it believing that doctors had our best interests in mind, that they would never lead us astray. And as much as I don't want to be like, you know, blowing a whistle saying never trust the doctor again, like I just want everyone to sort of go into it just like remembering that like you can believe them and trust them and that's totally fine, but there could be something off there. And it's always really important to believe um, the minor, the child, whoever's involved. And I think also just I mean, insist on um, being there or talking to the doctor, like really just like making sure that you're advocating on 
their behalf because like I just mentioned, it's extremely hard to stand up to doctors. As an almost 30 year old, it's still extremely difficult for me to do. So I can't even imagine trying to do that when I was 15. Um, so definitely if they can have someone on their side, it's even better. Yeah, oh, I appreciate that. Because what I'm also hearing is that we not only need to support young people in unlearning, but we also need to support them in like the critical analysis skills of like what support do you need before you go into a care provider's office? What are the questions you wanna be able to ask? Whether it is something as simple as like, can you slow down? Or I don't know that word, can you use a different term? Absolutely. I really, I, what are what symptoms are you experiencing? What's going on that you wanna make sure that the doctor is looking into? Are there any tests that you feel that should be run anything yeah. like that. there were so many times when i went in with excruciating pain after having like passed out multiple times and they would give me advil and send me on my way like i never got an ultrasound not that an ultrasound necessarily would have revealed anything but you know if there are tests that you feel are important like that's that's good to know as well yeah and there are a number of places in the book, which again, just a note, you can click that green button, yeah. which is vagina problems through Barbara's bookstore, um, where you mention, you almost like translate medical jargon into your own terms. And I, I really, I really like that. In particular, I love that part that you're like, endometriosis is the vodka shot on your way out for the night. And then vaginismus and vulvodynia are the $2 beers you take as soon as you get to the bar. Um, I mean, while there is so much, so, so many key issues related to this public health crisis that you touched on in your book, was, was there any part of the book that you felt is your favorite that you liked particularly and why? I think one of my most favorite, as I have, as you know, like a, one of my chapters is actually a letter to the doctors that didn't believe me. And that was like very cathartic to write. And I also, you know, wanted to include it because it is, it's something that I had done several times for different doctors that I had dealt with. And I felt like it was something that could possibly be cathartic for other people. And that honestly took me like an hour to write because I was just like, you know, like I knew what I wanted to say because um, it had been in me for years and years. So that was one of my favorite parts. And then, you know, just just being able, it was like a, a both good and bad to write the chapter on endometriosis. Good because it was a way for me to like really be honest about how terrifying, how terrible, how destructive this disease had been on my life in a way that I didn't feel I had been before. And I knew like, oh, people in my life are gonna see this. The public is gonna be able to see this. So it was like good in that way to just like have this release of like, hey, I really hate this. Um, and I'm gonna be really honest about that in this book. Um, so it was good, but it was also painful for the same reason because I really had to reach into that part of my heart and soul that, you know, tries to keep it under wraps for the most part, because, you know, I don't want to acknowledge how sad I am about this all the time, because, you know, then I would never get out of bed, you know, because it really does take a toll on you. But, you know, it was it was important to write and I think very cathartic for the most part, but it was it was also difficult to reach into there and sort of access that part of my heart, I guess. Yeah, right. That act of writing is so vulnerable and direct that I I felt your voice or I felt your voice so loudly and clearly. And I can imagine that it is a practice of like release and opening up that again, I would say as people raised as girls, as folks who are of a particular age, we are not encouraged to share out how we feel or how we relate, especially in terms of expectations around sex and what is an okay thing to talk about and what is not. And right, I, I remember in the portion when you're talking about friendships, also thinking that people feel overwhelmed by you being really honest. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's it's hard because like I want to be honest about it and it doesn't make me uncomfortable to talk about it at this point. I'm very open. Like 
I will talk to my dentist, my mailman, whoever about my vagina problems. But I've noticed that it actually makes other people uncomfortable, which then in turn makes me feel uncomfortable because it makes me feel like, oh, should I be uncomfortable about this? I think that's like a very hard lesson that I've had to learn too is um, the reaction that I want from people. And I've, I've had to coach people in my life at points and say, you know, you said this to me and I understand like what you meant by it. And I know you're there for me. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that you saying it that way, like really made me feel a certain way. And in the future, if you could react a little bit differently when I talk about my pain, like it would mean so much to me. Thank you. Um, and I, that's something that I've really had to work on because you know, I learned like pretty early on that I can't expect people to understand chronic pain and I can't expect them to know how to react to it. But at the same time, I can't expect myself to not be bothered when they don't react in a way that makes me feel supported. So it was really important for me to both, you know, be honest about my expectations for them, but to also be honest with them and say, this is what I need for me. Wow. And listening to you, it, also resonates with me again i'm coming from a sexual health education perspective that those are skill sets that we do not teach young people to develop no. or at least that that lesson plan is not widespread and yet i could see it being necessary for so many different conversations in someone's life right talking about yes boundaries and language and also noting that with different abilities with different chronic illnesses with different needs and access to resources or proximity to power, folks are gonna have different boundaries than others. And talking about experiences of pain may be a necessary way of being in relationship with folks who are enduring chronic illness. And when we impose boundaries around our comfort level, which may very well be rooted in ableism, right? Yeah. And ageism and fat phobia and any number of things, we actually are keeping our communities from actually answering questions or investing in solving public health crises like like you're describing. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, mean, I will say there are a couple of questions I want to ask around um, young people and also ways to see your book as one of many resources, because you mentioned in the book that there are not a lot of resources. It would be great to hear, you know, you provide some sharp media, no problem, sharp media literacy, uh, specifically this portion of the book where you're criticizing media portrayals of, or you're accounting for the lack of lubricant or where people peeing immediately after sex or removing glasses or squishy noises. Where is that in the media's portrayal of sex? Where, if anywhere have you seen more honest or supportive portrayals of sex i think like honestly the places where i started seeing it the most and like why i think it's really important to support online creators and you know only fans and that type of thing is like, i would see it in those spaces like the the traditionally like inappropriate spaces that you know, get banned from Instagram or shadow banned or sort of like threatened their accounts deleted just because they were posting about like being a stripper or like posting about, you know, posting their nipples when like men are allowed to post their nipples. And those were the spaces where I could go and they were talking about sex in an inclusive way. And that really helped me learn, oh yeah, people have sex in all kinds of different ways and I'm limiting myself by believing that the only way that I can have sex is through penetration. Like that's actually doing a disservice to me and it's just not true. Like it's completely non-inclusive. Um, but those were the spaces that I found that um, really helped me believe in that. So I, you know, online communities and Instagram creators and TikTok creators and, you know, I love that. So that's the type of area that I'd like to see major places invest more in like you know the people making these films um that we used to see in theaters or on tv like these tv shows that don't have the lube and have these weird sex scenes where the woman is orgasming after like 30 seconds of being dry humped like that's not accurate at all and if we invest in people in the creators and the people who care about uplifting these other stories like hopefully that's where we'll see more of it 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think your book is a resource to hold content creators accountable also to say, we're calling this out as inaccurate and uplifting, you know, feminist resources, online resources that are, as you're saying, potentially traditionally considered or considered by patriarchal mainstream media to be alternative, inappropriate, because they potentially provide a realistic portrayal. It's actually those that we want to affirm. And, and I would see, I think you've even asked this question is how else were you supposed to think about sex if all the information you're given is very limited, right? right. It was like I didn't even know that there were other types of sex. Like it never once crossed my mind. Like didn't even know the possibility was out there. What was oral sex? I didn't know. Didn't know that it could be a thing. Yeah, absolutely. Right, absolutely. Um, so with maybe a couple more questions left, uh, related to media, it also would be wonderful to hear if there are any particular books or other types of media that you would recommend for people who have vagina problems or want to support those who have vagina problems, anyone who want to supplement to your book? Yes, I have two that I'm going to recommend today. And I'm, you know, I'm sure there's a million others. But one book that I really love by Jennifer Block is called Everything Below the Waist. Um, it taught me so much of what I know about you know, women's health and medical, medical misogyny and just all of that. It's, um, it's, it's horrifying, but in like the best way, like it's, it's something that I think everyone should read. Absolutely. And then the other one is ask me about my uter uterus, which is by my friend, Abby Norman. Um, it again, touches on medical misogyny. Um, and I'll, I can write these in the chat, uh, in a bit too. So people know, but everything below the waist and um, ask me about my uterus. Amazing, right on. And I would also encourage others, if y'all have resources that you recommend, put them into the chat box. I know there is a great podcast called Tight Lipped. It's newly produced. They're coming out with a zine. Yeah, that I would definitely promote. It's made by lots of Chicago-based folks. Yeah. Um, so I think also related to what to do once folks have this book of yours that they can purchase through Barbara's bookstore is, you know, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are for what people should be doing after they read this book. It's such a galvanizing, encouraging read. What do you want folks to be doing after reading this book? It's such a, it's a hard question to answer, but I would say that I think why it feels so hard sometimes is that I tend to, and I think a lot of people might relate, is that I think like such big picture that I'm like, oh my God, how do we like cure this? How do we like save everyone living with this? Um, which I would love to do. I don't have the answer for that yet. I'm figuring it out. But I would say like to think small and to think like what you, what can you do today to make an impact? Maybe it's literally just supporting someone in your life who has vagina problems and reaching out and saying, hey, how are your pain levels today? Can I send you any food? You wanna talk about it? You wanna watch something on FaceTime together? Um, supporting anyone in your life that has any sort of chronic illness may not feel like you're doing something to like fight against this, but like you are, you absolutely are. Um, because you know, the people who are fighting against it, who are in this community, like we need the support of people. Otherwise we're never gonna have the strength to do it. And on a larger level, like get in touch with your local politicians, let them know that, hey, X amount of people are living with this. This is a crisis. We need more funding. This is what we need to happen. Like, um, don't be afraid to write letters. You know, I write letters to my old doctors, but I also write a letter, a lot of letters to politicians when I'm feeling angry. And I think it's a great stress reliever. Oh, right on, right on. We need, yeah, being more vocal and like using that rage and frustration as fuel. I think you've demonstrated that and given folks a lot of encouragement in your book. Um, I think I'll end with our last question and then we'll get to a question and answer portion with Allison. Is there is there anything else you want folks to know tonight? before before they leave and go read your book? Anything else you want them to know? 
I would say that when there is a story like this that you come across, um, speaking from personal experience, perspective and experience like it was difficult um, to get this book published uh, not everyone believes in stories like this particularly big publishers so if you come across a story like this support the creator um, even if you feel like you may not relate to it if you support stories like this more stories will be able to be told and that's ultimately what we need um, because you know this community and similar communities like this, we have stories that are waiting to be told. We just don't have either the belief or the sort of support of society yet. So um, I think like I'll leave it at that. Support local bookstores, support online creators, and you know, email your politicians, write them letters, call them. Why not? Ooh. Right on. And I feel like that totally corresponds with what Chicago Women's Health Center and the Chicago Foundation for Women are about. Local efforts that are challenging global problems. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me. I know Allison is going to come on for an open Q&A time. It was such an honor to read your work and to hear so much of your thoughts. Thank you so much. It was great to talk to you, Scout. Yeah. Yeah, this was so wonderful. Thank you both so much. I feel like I've learned a lot in the past like 40 minutes and it's all been like galvanizing. I'm like, yes, let's do it. Like, let's do all the things. We're calling all the people. Yeah. We're gonna do it. <laughs> all righty, so we're gonna dig right into it because we have some really wonderful questions and I, I feel like they're very thought provoking and I wanna just like jump right in. Um, so our first one, um, is if you could add one chapter to the book now, what would it be about? I think uh, in the last nine months of my life, a lot has happened with doctors. Like I finished writing this book and then I ended up having surgery in January. And since then I've had a lot of shitty experiences with doctors, like in a different way than I had before. And I wish that I could write another chapter now about how to hold these doctors accountable, how to talk to them, how to, make them do their job and how to stand up for yourself because that's something that i've had to learn uh pretty pretty tough lessons over the last nine months so that's definitely something that i've had moments where i'm like man i wish i wish i had had more time but maybe maybe a second book someday fingers crossed for sure so um oh by the way oh wait no i can't see i can't see the name of who asked that question so i'm so sorry i can't point you out um, our next question was asked by Emma and they say, Laura, thank you so much for sharing your words and thoughts, both in your book and this interview. I've been following your work for years and I'm wondering about your decision-making process when it comes to dealing with others in response to your illnesses. How do you decide whether or not to give people the time of day when they aren't responding well to your story and or choices about how you're dealing with your illnesses, especially loved ones? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Um, and I feel like my heart goes out to anyone dealing with that. It's such a tricky situation. I would say that I honestly take it day by day. Some days I have more patience than other days. Um, my pain levels vary a lot. So if I'm feeling like, okay, I have the time to throw them a bone and have a conversation with them today, great. But if not, like I always prioritize my health and my own well-being above any conversation like that because ultimately like Google is free and they can figure out what they need to know about endometriosis and how painful it is or whatever the situation is and it's not your job to continually teach people at the expense of your own well-being so always prioritize yourself but if you have the patience more power to you um Woof. same <laughs> <laughs> Woo. That is, that is a very real answer that I relate to so much. <laughs> Alrighty, our next one um, is from, oh, this one, I don't have the username either. So sorry, people who are writing really wonderful questions. I'm sorry, the username situation is fighting me today. Um, 
Thank you so much for being here. What is your advice for not letting these problems take over your self-image? It feels like a battle won when I get through one crisis, but because I'll continue to have crises for who knows how long. I wonder how to maintain the self-image of being capable of being more. I'd like to also be a fun girl, happy girl, sexy girl, whatever. How do you see past your VPs when they affect every aspect of your life. Do you even need to see past them to be happy? I would answer this um, in a way like, listen, I'm just gonna be frank. There are days when I don't see past them, when it's all that I see, when it completely consumes me, when all I do is lay in bed and cry. That's totally fine. And then I get up the next day and I say, okay, what's one thing today that I can just focus my energy on? Um, and sometimes it's honestly just watching housewives and getting through the day and that's okay. I would say take it one day at a time and try not to think too much in the future. I know it's easier said than done, but you know, things are changing all of the time. So you know, while you may always have vagina problems because it's incurable at this time, like we just have no clue what it's going to bring us. And I think, you know, just taking like little bites at a time, say, okay, I'm going to just get through today. Um, I'm going to give myself until 6 p.m. until I can watch Housewives or whatever it is. Sorry that I always talk about Housewives. I love it. And just like be a little bit like patient with yourself and try not to like think too much into the future and think too much about like crossing that bridge because you're not there yet. Um, and you know, you just don't know what could happen. And yeah, I know that's like such a like hallmark response, but that's how I like view it in my own head where I'm like, okay, everything feels like really overwhelming right now. And I don't know how I'm gonna ever live with this for the rest of my life. And then I say, okay, I'm just gonna focus on Monday. Let's just get through Monday and we'll worry about the rest of my life later, um, one day at a time. And I feel like that is relatable for, I think, whether or not you're dealing with vagina problems. I think we're all just trying to get through it one day at a time. <laughs> one thing that I actually found really interesting about that, um, and it's not necessarily off topic, but just something I want to recommend. We had an event recently with Talia Hibbert, who is a romance writer out of the UK, and which her all of her books are all about like representation, representation, representation. And her book, uh, Get a Life, Chloe Brown, is about the main character is dealing with chronic pain. Wow. And so, and it's really wonderful because it's a it's this woman who's just like she's living her life, she does her work, she like has days where she can't get out of bed and she has days when she can't when she can but like she's having sex she's meeting people she's living her life and so I think also like representation is so important like books like hers and books like yours where you're getting to see other people's experiences and understanding like yeah. it isn't always about the pain and even if the pain is really 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 bad today it might not be that bad tomorrow and that is okay. And if it is that bad tomorrow, that is also okay. Yeah. But knowing that there are other people that are experiencing those things and can connect to that and reading stories, whether fictional or real, that have those stories, I think is also super duper important. Um, I'm gonna pop a link for that book in the chat as well. Cause it's, I'm gonna tell you right now, like I can't recommend this book enough. It's so good. And it, again, off topic, she has three books or she has two books that are out in this series, they're sisters. And so two are out and the third one comes out in March, I think. Oh, and like, they're all amazing and they're so good and y'all should read them. <laughs> so next question, let me scroll on down. Um, okay, so this is from Kat. Um, they say, hi, Laura, thanks so much for sharing your story and being so open. As COVID has disrupted how people work with working remotely, as someone, or hang on, as someone who needed to work from home, have you noticed more people having more of an understanding for being more flexible with your work hours? And how do you think COVID will impact accessibility for employment for people who need time different hours during the health issues going forward? I also think this would be a really good question for Scout to answer too, because I imagine you have a really interesting perspective on this. Absolutely. Um, I will just say that like my life has improved so much being able to work from home. Um, and it's been very frustrating in a way to see how accessible some places can be now that 
you know, COVID happened. And I just wish that that had been the case always. And I hope that moving forward, like the question said, that this will become more of a trend and people will understand that, hey, they actually don't have to come into the office to do their job. Um, and, you know, they don't have to work from nine to five to do their job. But I'll let Scout um, offer more wisdom about that. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think it is again, it is similar to an unlearning and an opportunity to uncover what structures our nine to five workday, our work in person um, supports, right? Like in what ways does it actually support some bodies, not all bodies? And I also wanna note that there are frontline workers who are absolutely not having access to the benefit of remote work, right? And it is an, potentially an opportunity for us as a society to pause and say, why do we have the restrictions we have? In what ways does that support capitalism more so than actually people's bodies? And we know that people's bodies will always be subject to mistreatment on behalf of capitalism. And maybe it will be something that we should also be writing books about and writing our, our officials about um, as we would this global health crisis, this pandemic is also applicable to people's individual lives in a similar way to endometriosis and vagina problems are. Exactly. No, for sure. All right. looks like we have one more. There we go. All right. And this one, once again, I'm so sorry. I don't have your name on there, but I'm just going to go ahead and ask it. Um, I'm 20 and I'm not sure how to know when to trust doctors with their treatment plans, notably when I've been with them for a while, as well as when to trust their assessment of my progression or lack thereof. How do I know that I'm doing what I need to be doing and who to trust when they tell me I am or am not? It's exciting to be the one in charge of my own research and education, honestly, even if it can be validating and exciting at times. I think this is also a both of you question for sure. <laughs> yeah, that I would that's a really difficult question to answer, but I would say what I really want to stress and emphasize is to know that like if you are questioning what someone is saying to you or if they're talking to you in a way that makes you feel uncomfortable or like hey, I don't really feel like this is right or they're doubting your pain in any way like trust yourself and trust your instincts about that because i can tell you from past experience that pretty much every doctor that has done something that now looking back on it i'm like i wish i never would have done that like i had a feeling about it but i you know ignored it because doctors whatever um and so you know don't feel like you have to take on complete responsibility because i know that that's so much and no one should have to do that um but i just want you to remember to trust your instinct because they're there for a reason. For sure. Scout, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, yeah I mean, I absolutely I really appreciate Laura's answer. And wanna, I want to affirm also like a very deep history of women and queer folks and people of color not being believed and being silenced. And it's just throughout history. And, you know, there are a number of folks who have worked at the Chicago Women's Health Center who have actually published work about this. I would definitely recommend a, a publication of Terry Capsalis, and I'm happy to put the name into the chat in a little bit, that also prompts folks to think about what are all the supports you need in walking into a healthcare visit? What are the questions you want to ask and how do you ensure that you are the center of your of your visit, that it is your exam, it is your visit. So in terms of you asking questions, is it that you need an advocate? Is it that you need to have a pre and a during and a post visit practice or ritual for how you engage with reflecting, preparing, grounding yourself? And maybe you want an advocate there throughout all of it. Thinking back to the feminist health movement and even the abortion doula movement now, the doula movement at large, we aren't necessarily meant to be on our own in dealing with power. And in the context of medical visits, you are dealing with power. The medical institution as a gatekeeper to your resources, to more knowledge. And I would say come to Chicago Women's Health Center and we can talk you through some of those basic approaches that we use. 
Yes. Oh my gosh, that's so wonderful. Thank you both so, so much for being here. I have one more little thing um, at the bottom of the ask a question. They said, no question, only wanted to say thank you for sharing your story and getting this book made from someone with endo and her mom. It's so important to see this book out there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Here's to like 50,000 more books about this stuff. Yes, 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 yes. Please, please, please. Ugh. All right. Well, thank you both so much for being here. Thank you for sharing your stories and for talking about a subject that should definitely be talked about a lot more. <laughs> um, thank you all of you out there watching for attending this wonderful event. Please make sure to remember to push the green button at the bottom of the screen so that you can purchase vagina problems and make sure to put event at checkout. It's event with no S at the end. I just wanna make sure that's clear um, to get 10% off of your order. We also will have book plates available as well so you can get a signed copy of the book. Um, we hope to see you all again for one of our amazing virtual events. We have many more coming up before the end of the year. So make sure to check out our website and go specifically to the events page. Also, we just, I always like to mention that I run our super inclusive book club called Culture Exposure, which is where we read books that are written by authors representing a wide range of marginalized communities. So highly, highly recommend, make sure to check that out. Um, we host it, basically it's the last Wednesday of the month, but this year I believe our next one will be on November 18th because we want to avoid um, all the holidays and stuff. I want to thank again, Laura Parker and mm -hmm. Scout Bratt for being here today, as well as the Chicago Women's Health Center and the Chicago Foundation for Women. Um, before I finish, finish forever, do we want to have, um, would you guys like to say your social media handles or anything that anyone can follow? Yeah, the best way to follow me is at Laura, L-A-R-A, -A, like Laura Croft, at Laura E. Parker on pretty much everything. So I'll see you there. Perfect. Yeah, you can always find Chicago Women's Health Center at, at Chicago Women's Health Center on Instagram and Facebook. And ChicagoWomensHealthCenter.org is our website, a great way to get in touch with us. Perfect. Thank you both so, so much for being here. This has been delightful. I hope that we can maybe do this again when the second book comes out. I'm just saying. <laughs> yes, it does. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Thank you. All right, everyone. Bye. Happy reading.